I'm Petr Markovic. I come from the citizen, European Citizen Action Service, which is uh, a civil society organization based in Brussels, which will, uh, from January next year, celebrate its 30th anniversary. So we are uh, even older than European citizenship, but more or less they are siblings. As you know, European citizenship was introduced uh, in the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. Um, and it was introduced as an evolutionary concept by the Spanish uh, government at the time, meaning that the founding idea of introducing European citizenship formally into the treaties uh, was that this concept, EU citizenship, which comes um, as a complement to your national citizenship, should evolve. And one of the ways that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has shown that it has to evolve in is towards a digital EU citizenship. This is something that the President of the Commission has also announced in her uh, State of the Union address two months ago or so, saying that she wants a digi digital EU identity for all EU citizens. The way I understood it, and I hope it will pan out, is that all your services that you need to do, that in most member states or a large number of member states and local governments you can increasingly do uh, online, remotely, digitally, uh, will now be uh, a part of your European digital identity. So uh, in a way, we will dematerialize and digitalize our citizenship. We will be able to be active citizens, not just on the street, but using ICT uh, and these Web2 uh, technologies also, regardless of where we happen to be. Um, today, uh, I will echo some of what uh, Gilles said and try not to take too much of the content that, uh, that uh, Daniela will say. I will take you through a kaleidoscope of uh, e-participation, looking at the three functions that were mentioned by Carolina in the beginning, uh, three levels as much as I can mainly focusing on the European level but also touching on the national and local and just for now, let me say something that uh, has already been an, uh, announced in the announcement for the event, that today we are tackling formal channels of citizen participation, but there will be another session, right, Philippe, uh, in January or so, which will actually try to look at informal ways citizens can uh, participate and uh, be active online. Um, and uh, finally, how to boost your EU citizenship in your project will actually be the main goal of my presentation. We heard the definitions. I'm very happy that Carolina and I have used uh, similar sources. Uh, but just as a wrap up, let me say that e-democracy, what we call this new exciting um, area of e-democracy, the way I understand it is actually comprised of two dimensions. One is e-government and that one is actually top-down. It is the government trying to digitalize most of its services to citizens and providing in a transparent and effective accessible way services it would it would use to provide physically. But the bottom-up approach is what actually interests us and that is how citizens can be better uh, involved in decision-making uh, which means we want to increase participative democracy through digital means at the EU level. Uh, we've already gone through this with uh, Gilles' presentations. There are three ways in terms of intensity of our involvement uh, with the EU through digital means. The weakest one being we are passive recipients of information and we can monitor uh, processes, but still in a fairly passive way. Um, it's more, much better when EU citizens are involved in processes of consultation. What I, as someone who uh, have defended a PhD on e-participation and the European Citizens Initiative can tell you is that even when the Commission, for example, since 2000 onwards, uh, would frame um, its uh, channels of participation with citizens as a two-way street, as consultation too often it was actually uh, just uh, marginally consulting citizens uh, window shopping lipping lip service to citizen participation and in the past 
really just a couple, uh, not couple, but in the past few years, we see that this is changing. We see that the Commission and the Parliament, um, basically anyone aside from the Council, is really trying to engage with citizens, which means we can hope to have active participation. Um, let's put the EU in context, in a global context, shall we? So all the governments, not just the good ones, not just the democratic uh, ones, are digitalizing uh, their public spheres and uh, digitalizing ways of interacting with citizens. The bad way of doing it is where uh, you are very close to having uh, Orwell's uh, 1984 novel um, roll out in life is China, Russia is always uh, present in the media as uh, a country that is systematically using uh, social media and uh, digital advances in order to spur panic, uh, misinformation, disinformation, fake news. Um, I all come from Slovenia, but also from Montenegro, and I can tell you that uh, for example, meme pages on social media have been uh, incredibly successful uh, in shaping the outcome of the last uh, parliamentary elections in that country, which saw the toppling down of uh, a party that has ruled the country for 30 years. So it's not a naive thing uh, to speak about digital democracy at all. Um, what you see in the third pic there is a screenshot of the ECAS or European Citizen Action Services crowdsourcing platform. Uh, Gilles mentioned crowdsourcing in his presentation, basically uh, uh, trying to co-decide with citizens uh, on certain matters using uh, an online platform. And I think that in the European Union, we now have a different kind of uh, relationship between the supply and the demand side on e-participation. Basically, uh, for the longest of time, the uh, citizens wanted to be actively engaged, but there was not enough channels uh, that the EU had to offer. Now we have reached a slightly different situation where there are many channels of participation available, also formal ones, um, from Brussels and other institutions, but citizens are not actually using these channels and we need to see how to, um, uh, how to make this gap more narrow. Uh, the most successful member state in terms of e-democracy is of course Estonia. They have almost completely digitalized their citizenship. Citizens can do 97% of uh, things uh, uh, online. The only things you cannot do in Estonia is get married and divorced or sell a piece of real estate. Uh, I guess that kind of makes sense, you know, uh, you want to uh, kiss the bride or the groom and you want to see the real estate before you actually buy it. Um, but there are parts of the Estonian success story which are not that successful. So while e-government has been successfully digitalized, e-participation or the Estonian versions of the European Citizens Initiative um, has been going through hiccups. What sets Estonia apart, however, and it's completely different than any other EU member state, that it's the only country which allows for e-voting, so voting in elections online. Uh, and this is something that we can maybe try to uh, push for at the EU level. Um, Gilles said, what are e-participation tools that do not exist? Well, maybe if EU citizens could um, vote online for European Parliament elections, then we wouldn't be afraid before every new EP elections if the turnout will plummet or be lower again, which was luckily not the case in 2019. Okay. This is just a very complicated graph. There is no need to go into detail, but I only want you to see that the European Union has not really moved upwards much in the five years uh, interval uh, portrayed here. Uh, so the use of online consultation and e-voting uh, in this period has not increased much for the EU according to this relevant study. Um, and I foresee that due to the pandemic, 
uh, this graph will change in the next five year period. What are some of the challenges that also were asked uh, in Slido? Um, so I was right. Uh, what, are, what is the other side of the medal of e-participation in the EU? First, disinformation. Um, citizens uh, without an adequate level of media literacy can get lost uh, in uh, finding the right information which shapes how they participate at the EU level. Another problem is representativeness. So if you look at uh, public consultations, one of the modes that you can participate uh, in uh, EU decision making, um, you'll see that even though they are uh, framed as citizen participation, those who take part in them are usually organized interests, private interests, organized civil society. So rarely um, citizens actually directly take part, and I will show you some statistics later on. Another problem is the digital divide. How can we expect that everyone has an equal right to participate digitally in the decision making at the EU level if not everyone has the same access to internet? Uh, in 2019, I looked up some statistics before uh, we started today. Um, uh, the 85% of Europeans on average use the internet every week, but this changes when you go from one member state to another. It's highest in Denmark, 95%. It's lowest in Bulgaria, 67%. Um, the figures also differ if you look at different age groups. So naturally, you know, people uh, in their uh, teens and 20s are practically born with a smartphone in their hands. Uh, whereas uh, those who are elderly do not maybe even own um, a smartphone, a computer, or something that they can be digitally uh, active with. Two other points, and these are just food for thoughts so that we can maybe come back to uh, in the discussion part. Seizing the moment, um, I think that the pandemic actually gives us uh, an opportunity of a lifetime for the EU to uh, bridge the gap between the citizens and the union. We are all, at least now in Brussels, where the lockdown is pretty much severe. We are at home, we are glued to our PCs, we wake up and go to sleep um, with uh, our smartphones, and this is the time to actually engage with the citizens. They will never be so present. Our presence is now not physical, so Brussels isn't as uh, uh, far, it is digital. And secondly, I think that uh, just like homeworking, um, e-participation is here to stay. It will not really go back to uh, the old normal before the pandemic. It may not have uh, the intensity it has now, but I think it is here to stay. So these are the, moving on to the second part of the presentation, these are the channels of participation that uh, uh, I put in a list and that uh, Gilles has uh, so nicely covered. Um, so I won't go through them again. If you have any questions, you can ask us um, at any time at, on Slido. I just wanted to give you some snippets of how um, in my previous work as an activist, not as a researcher this time, uh, I have used um, these channels in different projects. So for example, starting with the European um, elections, uh, while I was working in a much smaller organization called uh, East Foundation, also in Brussels, uh, and while we were uh, involved in a beautiful project uh, that uh, uh, called Trans Europa Caravans, by accidentally, Gosha uh, is present in this call and she was the project manager of this project. Uh, we were teaming up with a bunch of volunteers in 15 different member states involved in uh, mobilizing citizens to vote in the European elections in 2019, uh, organized by This Time I'm Voting, this transnational network of volunteers and activists, which then transformed after the elections into uh, together.eu. Um, and 
together with them, we were teaming up. So we had our projects, they had their projects, we made events together, which is the essence of Europe for Citizens. You can also do this before the elections um, in, wait, in 2024. Okay, uh, then European Citizens Initiative. I um, am, well, this is my favorite instrument by far. Uh, it's the most exciting one because it actually is a complete, uh, let's say, enfant uh, terrible in the EU because all the agenda setting in the EU usually happens uh, fro top down. Someone sits in Brussels or in capitals of member state or big organizations uh, consult with the commission and then the commission has the monopoly of legislative initiative and it will uh, send a proposal to the parliament and the council. Um, so legislation in the EU usually is a stream that goes top down, but the ECI was made uh, precisely with the intention that agenda setting should be also done from the bottom up and EU citizens from at least member state can uh, let's say, morally oblige the commission to legislate on a matter that we hold dear. Why did I share this image with you? Because the organization I work in... Hislen, in determinados aspectos. Tenemos, colaboramos en la gestión de este foro, ECI. Distintos, la resolución de distintos conflictos, etcétera. Y veis el cuadrado verde. So, um, while I was teaching a course in the spring semester this year um, on EU politics, I invited uh, 20 students to um, discuss the implications of the COVID pandemic on the ECI. And this was published on the ECI forum. So if you want to write a project and you want to have uh, a link with a tool for citizen participation in the EU, uh, you could contact the ECI forum as well and uh, try to discuss a topic pertaining to the ECI and it will be published there and it will be great for your dissemination and outreach. EP petition, also coming back to Trans Europa Caravans, we launched a petition for genuine mobility in Europe. Um, one thing just to add on what Gilles said, um, e-petitions can actually make a difference and there are many success stories, but um, you are also just one citizen um, in a huge pool of citizens and uh, many of petitions actually get lost in the corridors of the parliament. So you really need to be persistent uh, in order for it to pass the petty committee and actually go to the plenary or something. But um, it's actually, whether it succeeds or not, it's a good idea to also consider launching a petition as a part of your uh, project. Online public consultations are a bit more difficult, as I said, um, designed for citizens, but actually taken over by much more organized groups of interests. You see here a slightly outdated statistics from a report uh, written by ICAS on public uh, consultations uh, and uh, you see that the green one represents the citizens. So of all the inputs given in these years, um, up to one quarter were citizens, the rest were, uh, you know, other kinds of organized interest. Um, let me see the time. We are still okay, but I will try to not say too much about the conference on the future of Europe, uh, but it is the most exciting uh, mode of e-participation for all of us because it's frustratingly still vague. The joint declaration of the institutions, which is supposed to finally give us the final word on how the conference will look is still pending, if I'm not wrong. Um, yeah, so we still don't know the details, but whatever you've read about the structure of the conference is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll explain in a second. So this conference is not the one-off event, so the conference word might be misleading. It's a two-year period where um, a whole ecosystem is supposed to be provided for not just the EU, but a lot of civil society organizations in many member states to allow citizens to be creative and try to 
uh, have their say on the future of Europe. It's supposed to be a transnational festival of democracy. So all those agoras, you know, the youth agora and different agoras which will be organized, that's just at the top. But what the commission wants... Hey, now, can I, sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but I think we are now already anticipating on Daniela's presentation. Okay, okay. So, no, I will... Um, I don't yeah. know, maybe you can say a few sentences to, to close for now, and then we will tackle the questions we, yes. we have received. And okay. uh, after this, we, we will start with the, the conference. Okay. So let know. me just uh, not go into the conference on the future of Europe anymore, but I just uh, on this ecosystem. So a wider web of activities around the conference, which you can base your projects on. Since it will be a two year period, whenever the next call comes, you still can uh, count on the conference to be active and you can uh, base your uh, transnational project on that. Just to give you an example of ECAS, I crossed over best practices because we've submitted Euro for Citizen uh, projects which are still pending so I cannot know if they are good or bad. But for example, we have a project around something called the European Hub for uh, citizen engagement, which is a digital hub which allows uh, civil society organizations across Europe to digitally help each other out. Um, and uh, voila, that's one example. A second example is that uh, we want to cr uh, crowdsource citizen opinions in different member states on air quality. And all of this can be nicely tied up with the Conference on the Future of Europe. Okay. Uh, the last slide I have for you is actually what you can do either digitally or in person uh, prior to, during and after the project um, in order to amplify your uh, voice in the EU prior to the project. Anyhow, you have to build a network of CSOs because you have to have partners from different states, but don't just stick to those partners, build a wider network of those you usually work with, involve your national contact points, contact Europe Direct, contact the rep office of the commission or the parliament early on. Also build up the momentum of the event before because some of those events you will have organized anyhow, right? Um, don't just do this for the sake of the dissemination uh, dimension of the project. Uh, link up with existing EU events and the events of your and other organization. During the implementation of your project, um, already have a ready list of friendly media and just compile as many pics, videos for the consumption on your social media. Always try to contact in order to increase this European and transnational dimension, contact the relevant EU institution uh, by either looking at the organogram of the institution or go to who is who in the EU website in order to find out who you should write to, look up your MEP. Simply uh, don't just uh, consider the European dimension of your future project as something you have to tick in a checkbox in order to get the project actually truly important to um, have it throughout the implementation. Uh, another trick that we have found useful is always to see which country is going to preside over the council in the coming period. You always know the next three, uh, because then you can incorporate this into your project. You can, for example, uh, have Slovenia as an incoming uh, presiding uh, member state. Uh, and since you know Slovenia is going to preside, you get a partner organization from Slovenia so that you can then directly contact the presiding country with, you know, the results of your project or to invite them to your event, etc. Um, now, I can't really read what it says here. Prepare the groundwork for your output geared towards the institutions. Uh, and always know that in case you want to do some of the events in Brussels, um, the European Economic and Social Committee or somewhere else, the local EC and EP office will give you free um, venues for your events. There is no time to cover what to do after the project and we can discuss it in um, the um, right now. To conclude, um, ECAS has a crowdsourcing platform and we're just about to um, 
first close on two crowdsourcing exercises which involve uh, the impact of the pandemic on mobile EU citizens and the impact of the pandemic on CSOs involved with the defense of EU citizens' rights. Um, I'm just monopolizing this space here to tell you that I might share the links for these uh, two uh, surveys with you in case you are interested. Here is my contact and um, thank you so much for your attention.